We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. One of the things I love about Indeed is it makes hiring all in one place so easy and streamlined so I can spend more time on the rest of my business. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. From your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Nelson, and it's Thursday night, January 4th, 2024, as we bring you a new episode. We've got a new Dylan Cease rumor via Joe Sherman of the New York Post. We've got minor league signings as the Chicago White Sox bring Brett Phillips and Chad Cool into the fold to compete for major league spots. It doesn't get any more exciting than this, folks. I get, of course, but we'll talk about those news items and chat about unique contract perks in Major League Baseball. Yoshinobu Yamamoto is getting some premium airline tickets in addition to the money he is making from the Los Angeles Dodgers. What would we ask in contract perks of signing major league deals? We'll share our crazy requests at the end of the show. Joining me is the managing editor of SoxMachine.com. It's Jim Margulis. And Jim, the hot stove is burning up with White Sox moves. Non-roster White Sox action. Uh, weeks weeks before they usually announce their entire <laughs> slate of non-roster invitees, which is actually a post I really enjoy writing every year, the who's who. Um, but having yeah. them trickle out like this while uh, major league positions go unsolved, like right field in particular, is uh, not a whole lot of fun. We're still waiting for Chris Getz to acquire his first good player. <laughs> he might be waiting <laughs> for a while. I mean, to your point, yeah, let's just... This is the type of news that tr- typically trickles in like before Valentine's Day. Like, oh, hey, by the way, uh, beat reporters, if you see these guys when you arrive in Glendale, <laughs> the reason is yeah. we have invited them to spring training to compete, in quotes, for Major League spots. But maybe this is a new angle the White Sox could take advantage of, Jim, to find advantages against their opponents is beat them to the punch in signing these guys a month before they probably could have signed them pretty much. And like with Phillips yet another 2019 Royal <laughs> just keep, keep adding to that. Yes. Yeah. The white Sox have now employed eight, uh, 2019 Royals, uh, since that team existed. And they, I think they have four of them now on the roster plus Pedro Griffol managing them. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, because that was a great team, the 2019 that's Kansas the, City Royals. Yeah, I mean, that's the case against Martin Maldonado. He was their supposed pitcher whisperer half a season. They trade him. 
pitching staff doesn't get actually any better <laughs> over the course of the year. Didn't seem to take away any kind of meaningful, uh, uh, you know, lasting lessons from the Martin Maldonado stay. So that's when, you know, when they talk about leadership and how he could, uh, you know, what kind of wisdom he can impart on the pitching staff. I say like, look at those Royals and you know, that, that's, that's, that's how I check my, uh, temper my enthusiasm with that regards that move. You know, I'm just curious who, is still left over that the White Sox can acquire from the 2019 Royals. Whit Merrifield. All right, so you got Whit Merrifield. Uh, Jorge Soler. Uh, Adalberto Mondesi. If, is he still playing baseball? I don't know. So we got Merrifield. We, you mentioned Jorge Soler. Soler hit 48 homers in 2019. I mean, the White Sox acquired 48 homer Jorge Soler. Uh, yeah, that would make things a little bit more enjoyable to watch. So you got Merrifield, you got Mondesi, you got Solaire. What's Ryan O'Hearn up to these days? <laughs> Wasn't didn't he discover a second life with the Orioles? Oh, he probably did. Uh, Hunter Dozier, Billy Hamilton, Brad Keller. <laughs> well, Billy, yeah, Billy Hamilton's already you know, he's on that White Sox list. They've already checked that box. Yeah, along with Chelsea Cuthbert, they already yep. they already tried Cuthbert. Uh, that's the position player front. Uh, is Jacob Junis still out there? I think so. Yeah, Bubba Starling retired, so he's not around. Is, uh, did, Cross him is off the Danny list. Duffy, is Danny Duffy trying to pitch? Yeah, Josh stuff? Josh Stalmont just signed with the Twins, so they'll have to wait on that uh, one. Damn. Brad damn, Keller, I think, would be the out. ultimate one, like moving on from the Tim Anderson era if <laughs> uh, they, they somehow acquired Brad Keller, the guy who started it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's still plenty of X 2019 Royals that the White Sox can still acquire. We're not suggesting that they should. We're just saying there's still options out there. But joking aside, Brett Phillips, I think many White Sox fans know about Phillips. Bats left-handed, throws right-handed, along with the Royals, started his career at the Brewers. Made it to the World Series with the Tampa Bay Rays. He was the guy that had that base hit in the World Series and that crazy game-ending walk-off in which Randy Rosarena tripped over himself, but the Dodgers couldn't tag him out, and he still scored uh, at home plate. That was Phillips with the, the base knock. Uh, Phillips spent some time with the Baltimore Orioles in 2022, and last year with the Los Angeles Angels, really small sample size as Phillips only played 39 games. Phillips is not a good hitter at all. Like last year he had 175 slug 333 with three homers and six RBIs in 71 of plate appearances and kind of impressive. Phillips struck out 36 times in 71 plate appearances. That's a strikeout rate of 50.7%. And for his career, he's a 187 career hitter. Now, we're not crazy about batting average in this podcast as you guys who've been listening to us for 11 seasons now. No batting average is something that we don't really leave our cap on, but when you are a career 187 hitter that's played multiple seasons in your baseball career, yeah, you can't hit. And last year, even though it was 39 games, Philip was not a great defender for the angels. However, looking on the bright side, why do the White Sox bring in Brett Phillips? Well, in 2021 and in 2022, Phillips graded out as a well above average outfielder, defensively worth plus 11 and plus 10 runs above average, especially with his range. And he has a very good arm for right field, in which his average throwing velocity was 91.7 miles per hour, and Phillips is an above average runner. You add it all up, and Jim... Phillips could be a fourth outfielder for the White Sox, but why do so many White Sox fans at this moment fear that Brett Phillips will be the White Sox starting right fielder on opening day? One is the fact that he's a 2019 Royal. Uh, the other is that the White Sox haven't done anything above him. Like, it's still Oscar Colas, who nobody seems to like, and maybe for good reason when it comes to uh, how he performed in all aspects of the game in Chicago. Then you have Gavin Sheets, and that's about it. And um, Chris Getz has been on record of saying that they've asked too much of Sheets. 
uh, defensively and saying like that, you know, he's done everything they've asked him to do to the best of his abilities. And certainly, you know, it's shown that he, you know, has some ability to play the outfield, but not nearly enough physical tools to make up or not enough of like, you know, acumen in terms of like reading and jumps and everything like that positioning to make up just for the sheer lack of foot speed and closing speed. So like, Everything saying that, you know, the White Sox aren't going to have sheets out there on a regular basis, but they haven't required, they haven't acquired sheets as a replacement unless they really believe in Oscar Colas bounce back or like Romy Gonzalez is somehow still in the picture because he's still on the roster. But yeah, I mean, Phillips is the only new guy so far. We've seen, seen some outfielder movement with uh, Harrison Bader and Kevin Kiermeyer signing. And like those would be good moves if the White Sox were continuing along this line of like premium defenders who might not really be much with the bat, but are major league players signing for, I think they both signed the exact same contract one year, $10.5 million. And Kiermaier said that teams besides the blue Jays weren't really interested in his services. Uh, you know, he was surprised by how uh, little interest he received after a gold glove season and after being like a good on base guy and somebody who helped supplement a lineup and, you know, like if the White Sox are going all in on this, you know, putting the best possible defense behind a pitching staff, it's probably going to be pretty young. Okay, then, like, get a good slash great defender in Kiermaier or Bader, because Bader is the same guy, and pay him a bit more and maybe get some offense out of it, too. But, uh, yeah, because they're cutting corners, like, it really seems like they're just sticking to the script of, getting guys who do one thing well and everything else poorly and Phillips fits that mold. And it's like, yeah, you know, Paul DeYoung joined the white Sox and said like, Hey, they offered me a major league deal. That's why I'm here. Like that was kind of his uh, chief reason for being a member of the white Sox. And like Phillips got a minor league deal, but everything else with DeYoung, uh, you know, DeYoung's got a better bat. Like the, the, the production has been a little bit uh, better aside from the last two months in which he was Phillips grade bad uh, with Toronto and San Francisco. Uh, like young is kind of the same guy. And so Phillips fits that mold. And if he has a good spring training or if the white Sox don't acquire anybody else and it's Phillips versus sheets versus Colas, you're like, yeah, there, it stands the reason that you could see a whole lot of Phillips, just like you could see a whole lot of uh, Jake Marisnik early on last year when he was that same guy, the non-roster invitee who had some major league production and defense and might be able to fit in as a fourth outfielder. Like the white Sox have a whole bunch of fourth outfielders. They just don't have a third outfielder. I didn't know that Kiermaier said that there was very little interest in him. When I hear that, I get a little, I get a little upset, Jim, like, because I agree with you. And we've talked about this, like 10 and a half, $11 million just to get through the 2024 season. And if your outfield is Ben Attendi and we're all hoping that he bounces back from an atrocious defensive season in 2023. Luis Robert and Kiermaier, at least any ball hit the center and right field is going to have to travel really far in order to not be caught by Robert and Kiermaier. Even though Kiermaier doesn't bring a whole lot offensively. I didn't know that Kiermaier said that, that kind of, that really irks me because it's not, it's not a big commitment. It's a one year commitment to get through a 2024 season, you can guarantee Kiermaier is going to be a starter. Man, if you're healthy, yeah, you could play 100-plus games with us in t for the entire season. If you don't want to no know trade clause, you know, if we're not good and you want to be traded to a contender, maybe we could find you a home to a contender after the trade deadline. <sighs> Man, it just really feels like with some of these deals right now, like, it's just about how how cheap can we build out the rest of this roster? Because if Phillips does make the opening day roster, he'll earn $1.2 million, which is nothing, nothing in major league baseball. And I guess when it comes to my 26 man projected roster that I've been updating and posting on social media, Jim, uh, I, I guess I need your insight here. So when it comes to right field, Let's say if we had one of those fancy whiteboards with the magnets of all the players and we had to throw names up on the, the board of what the starting roster is, 
Uh, is Gavin Sheet still the projected starter in right field for the White Sox, or do we need to put Brett Phillips up there? I would say Sheets first just because he is on the 40-man roster. Uh, he has experienced the White Sox have shown a certain comfort in playing him against, uh, you know, maybe their best interests in doing so. But uh, so that's why I have him first. But yeah, it is a thin line between him and everybody else. I mean, Colas, like if he has a good spring, is he back in everybody's good graces? Like if he's throwing to the right guy and, and, you know, taking good breaks and showing like the kind of defense he played in Charlotte uh, the year before where we didn't think he'd be an atrocious defender. Like, yeah, it really does seem like an open-ended picture. And that's why it would help if like they just acquired somebody on a major league contract in the outfield, just kind of resolve this once and for all into where like if Phillips is the fourth outfielder on opening day, because he can play center and he can play right, And you're not putting Romy Gonzalez or anybody else who can barely play the position out there. Like, sure. Then Phillips makes a lot more sense, but like, while there's nobody better than him and while you're trying to talk yourself into platoon when he can't even hit righties, uh, that's a, uh, you know, that, that's why I think there's this, uh, this discomfort just because like, like my issue with gets right now is like, yeah, he hasn't signed a good player. Like the job he's doing right now, even if you think it's a good job, even if you're not, I should say a good job, but like acceptable job, he's carrying out orders uh, to cut payroll. He's doing his best to get the 2024 season over with as quickly as possible. Like we all could do the job he's doing, like giving guys who are grateful for plate appearances or major league roster spots, like $5 million at most. Like Eric Fetty's probably the, been the only guy he's had a fight over. And we don't know if Eric Fetty's any good. So like everybody else, like who uh, could theoretically be a GM could do the job that gets is doing right now by signing guys who are grateful for the opportunity. And the re- there's a reason why they can't be picky. So uh, that's, I think what's, uh, you know, as this off season drags on, we're not seeing like any kind of real ambition from what the White Sox are doing. Like, there's a reason why he signed the guys he's signing, but there comes a point like, can he actually identify a good player and close the deal? Because like Rick Hahn yeah. really struggled with that after the rebuild trades. Uh, like he, you know, he's good at like giving closers money and relievers money. But when it came to like uh, an outfielder with upside or trades that he couldn't quite pull off because Twitter ruined them or whatever he said, like right. he couldn't actually close a deal and like position players who could be actual upgrades. Yeah, you got to be quite the salesperson in order to be successful as a baseball general manager or president of baseball operations. I mean, that's a difference across the entire league. I mean, that's the criticism right now that out of all GMs in baseball, Brian Cashman is now facing criticism in New York for his inability to close out a deal with Yamamoto and even Steve Cohen. I had dinner with the guy, invited him over for dinner at my house, and Steve Cohen couldn't close the deal because the Dodgers are closing deals. Andrew Friedman and that ownership group knows how to close deals and keep people either in Los Angeles or get them to move to Los Angeles. They are crushing it right now. And I'm glad you you mentioned that because, yeah, it's it's a sales tactic and technique like coffee is for closers. And if you can't close as a GM or president of baseball operations, then your team is going to consistently struggle both in free agency and in trades. And if you struggle in those areas, unless your boss is Jerry Reinsdorf, you're not going to last very long in, in your role in the major league. So yeah, we, we know that he can sign guys that are grateful to be major leaguers, Uh, I'm really glad you brought up that point, Jim, because I I think he hit the nail on the head there. Like, yeah, this is what Chris gets is proving. I can sign guys that are desperate for a major league job, but can you do more? And I guess we wait. What other option do we got right now? Uh, Watching Chris gets uh, cook as the cool kids would say. Uh, I I do want to say this about Brett Phillips though. And I mentioned this on Twitter because the White Sox are trying to get better defensively and they're also trying to quote unquote improve the culture within the clubhouse. Brett Phillips is really easy to root for on and off the field. He can't hit like everybody knows he can't hit. I think Brett Phillips knows he can't hit, but as a bench guy, it's like your 26 guy in the roster. It's not the end of the world. 
I mean, he's like Billy Hamilton. And there was a lot of White Sox fans happy to see Billy Hamilton on the roster. So uh, that's the silver lining is that Brett Phillips is easy to root for. He is a good guy. Yeah, he has a really goofy laugh. He does have a goofy laugh, yes. Yeah, like this weird, like kind of like donkey sounding, like almost <laughs> uh, sounds like he's asphyxiating, like just... Uh, when he really uh, laughs hard, it's it's bizarre. You can find videos of it, but like, it, my concern is like, would the White Sox break his spirit? I hope not. Like, <laughs> it just you know, good club. Yeah, I guess you know Billy Hamilton manager to uh, stay smiling, but other guys who are supposed to be great clubhouse guys are like, fix the you know, turn around the culture. Just you know, the White Sox have a way of um, uh, just destroying spirits and smiles and everything like that. Does anybody remember laughter? Uh, and comes to the White Sox, they don't. Uh, does Pedro Grafal laugh? Do we know what kind of laugh Pedro Grafal has? Has he ever laughed? I've seen him smile. But it's kind of like... Has this, he laughed? No, it's like the smile is kind of like one of those like uh, ones where if you're in a crowd of people and somebody's smiling and pretending to get the joke... Like, mm. yeah, 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 like, yeah, and just hoping Got somebody it. changes the subject before, like, they turn to like having to add on to whatever he's talking about, and they don't understand. Like, it's it's an uneasy smile. He would prefer not to. Maybe he's maybe he's not a laugher. Maybe he's just one of those people that say, "Hey, that's funny," and they smirk at you. I don't know. I he likes I, music. Can't name a song. He uh, <laughs> likes humor, but can't tell a joke and doesn't laugh at him. And the season ticket holder event at the Field Museum later in January. I do want somebody to ask him, Pedro, what is your favorite dinosaur? And see if he can name a dinosaur. <laughs> uh, poor Pedro. Uh, all season long, buddy. All season long. The other minor league signing, the White Sox signed right-handed pitcher Chad Cool. And Cool is mostly sinker slider these days. He threw the slider more in 2023 than the sinker. He threw the slider about 44% of the time to just 35% of the time with the sinker as he pitched 38 and a third innings for the Washington Nationals last year. He appeared in 16 games, made five starts. His ERA was 8.45. And the previous season in Colorado, 27 games started 137 innings with a 5.72 ERA. And he was worth half a win, half a war, according to Fangraphs.com. And Cool's best season of the major leagues was back in 2017, a 2.2 war season. Now, the sinker is awful. Negative 26 run value in 2022, negative 12 run value in 2023, despite the few innings that he pitched. The four seamers not better. So Cool doesn't really have a fastball. The good news. Cool sinker's pretty good. Seven, a positive seven run value in 2022 and positive two run value in 2023. So maybe this could be another reclamation project for the White Sox. Could they make Cool into just a reliever and just focus on throwing nothing but sliders uh, to opposing batters? Or if they're still looking to add more into the starting rotation depth, Jim, like Cool is not going to make a projected 26-man roster for me. But Charlotte needs pitchers. And if Chad Cool still thinks that he could be a starter in the major leagues and the White Sox are signing Cool to a minor league contract to help out with the starting rotation depth, well, Charlotte Knights could use starting pitchers. Yeah, there's a common thread with another White Sox acquisition. Cool missed, uh, like, or after, like, he was uh, optioned, he took the rest of the season off because his wife was dealing with breast cancer. Uh, so that was, you know, a, a, a side issue he was dealing with that's probably very front of mind for him. Uh, but it reminds me a little bit of Max Stassi, who missed uh, all of 2023. Early on, it was because of shoulder issues rehabbing, but then it was because of a his, his uh, kid was born really early, really prematurely. He was in the NICU. Uh, basically for months and so like between the two of them like they're kind of betting on guys who have been through some hell <laughs> recently and just uh, might have a little bit of a rebound in them just from having a whole lot of a lighter mental load uh, coming into the season so yeah I am interested to see like you know 
how he comes into it, like what, uh, you know, whether he's refreshed, you know, if, if the worst is behind him and maybe like he uh, is able to enjoy the season a little bit more and get a little bit of a bounce back, even if he is starting the season in Charlotte and being more that fringe guy, spot starter, call up type. Um, you know, I imagine this year might be a lot better for him just because like, hopefully in that case that the, uh, uh, his wife's cancer issue is resolved. Fun fact, kind of. The Charlotte Knights last year only had three pitchers that pitched more than 75 innings for the team. Nate Fisher, Garrett Davila, and Chase Solsky. That's it. Solsky, yeah. Solsky. Um, yeah, I mean, like, they would have had uh, Jesse Schultens, but he was needed. Right. <laughs> like he was. The White Sox really had to dip into their... Uh, you know, the rotation depth, they had a uh, Davis Martin was supposed to be a part of that. He had Tommy John surgery. Um, yeah, just that that whole uh, yeah, everybody who's vaguely promising in Charlotte had to be called to Chicago. Right now, looking at like what the opening day nights rotation can be. And it's interesting. Nick Nestrini, Christian Mena, Jared Schuster, maybe Jake Eater and Chad Cool, like. I, I find this starting pitching depth behind the projected five-man roster intriguing. Like, you have the Jan interesting arms in Estrini, Mena, Schuster, and Eater. We don't know if they're any good. But they're still young, and they have some promise. And then you got a veteran still looking to stick in baseball as long as possible in Chad Cool. This is better than what the Knights had last year, which was two starters and a bunch of bullpen games. Like, there's just no way that is sustainable to carry out a minor league baseball season. So while we give a little grief to Chris Getz that he hasn't signed anyone of significance yet, and maybe he disputes that with the Eric Fetty and Martin Maldonado signings, which I think we would roll our eyes, Jim, and disagree uh, that... Yeah, uh, maybe Fetty. Would... There was some legit interest from the Mets, but nobody yeah. was signing Maldonado. Nobody was signing Maldonado. Yeah, Fetty's like Fetty is not a good player. Or we don't know if he's a good player. He might be a good player. We can't say he's a good player right now. But it's a good acquisition. Like it's good use of the White Sox money. Good use of the innings. Uh, there's enough intrigue to where like it has my attention. So it's a good acquisition. Maldonado. Uh, I'm not buying it. I can see it, but like I, I'm like I said with the 2019 Royals, uh, I'm I'm not necessarily thinking he's going to do anything special for the White Sox. Yeah. So, but to give him some credit, like we we still like what he got for Aaron Bummer. At least when it comes to starting pitching depth here, this is a lot better than what the White Sox entered 2023 with. And man, I don't. I felt like we were 50 canaries in the coal mine last year, Jim, before the 2023 Mm -hmm. season started. Just like pounding the table. You don't have enough starting pitching depth. You don't have enough starting pitching depth. And like anything else that we suggested Rick Hahn should do, Rick Hahn ignored us, and that's why he's unemployed. But at least with if this is the opening day night's rotation, then it's worthwhile to have the Knights on in the background with the minor league baseball streaming package. Because like I said, the Strini, Mena, Schuster, Eater, these guys are young. They have some promise and they're interesting. It it would be worthwhile to watch the Knights, which it hasn't been worthwhile to watch the Knights in a while. Yeah, like Matt Thompson could theoretically be part of that too, but usually teams like to have one veteran in the rotation to where like if guys are on pitch limits or if they're on innings limits, uh, and they have to be handled with some care. And I think that would extend to uh, Eater, certainly, with the year he had last year trying to come back from Tommy John surgery and like Nestrini. Mena, you know, if they're going to be six month pitchers, you know, they might be on uh, workload limits early. Like managers, teams typically like having like one or two veterans in that rotation be like, I'm going to give this guy the ball. He can throw 90 plus pitches. He can have a rough inning and go back to the mound. We don't necessarily have to worry about overusing him because like he knows the deal. We know the deal. He's been through it before. He knows what it's supposed to feel like and he'll let us know if he can't do it. And and they tend to be like the, uh, the, the ballast of that rotation while all these other guys have workload restrictions just so you don't get the point where like you're in, in seventh consecutive start 
where nobody can go beyond four innings because of different restrictions and the bullpen's getting worn out. So I think Cool fits that role as a veteran who can uh, throw strikes, uh, maybe keep the ball in the park, which is very important in Charlotte to not uh, allow uh, homers in bulk and uh, maybe give uh, uh, everybody in Charlotte just uh, a little bit easier time just managing the pitching staff over the next four days. So when we had my former college classmate, Dave Lazat, who is the voice of the Gwinnett Stripers, the AAA affiliate of the Atlanta Braves on a podcast to talk about what the White Sox were getting back in that Aaron Bummer trade, he recalls last year calling a series against the Charlotte Knights where it was a different pitcher every single inning. Like that's how bad it got for the Charlotte Knights on the pitching death front. So I hear you, Jim. But like Nestrini, Eater, Mena, these guys, I, I think the White Sox need 100 innings out of them. That doesn't mean they're going to go more than five plus innings. And to your point, like with the restrictions, they may be kept to four or five innings. But I am begging the White Sox with your AAA affiliate, do not have four game series in which you have to use a different pitcher every single inning because you don't have enough starting pitchers. So at least that's the silver lining. Maybe... We're going to continue to see more of these minor league signings like Chad Cool added to the White Sox roster. And I know White Sox fans are like stressed out because they're thinking these guys will be part of the major league roster. We'll see. But just so you know, on fan graphs, they're doing their projections for the upcoming season with what moves have already been made. And right now the White Sox are projected to have the 28th ranked starting rotation. And that's with Dylan Cease. So if they move... <laughs> If they move Cease, uh, the White Sox only have a projected better starting rotation than Oakland and Colorado. And if they move Cease, I'm sure they're going to drop below Oakland or Colorado, uh, which is obviously great company to be in. There's a lot of work to be done here. So while I like this idea of adding veterans like Chad Cool to bolster the starting rotation depth in AAA to pair with the young, interesting Pitching guy prospects the White Sox have, I don't know. Maybe there's no such thing as a pitching prospect. The Charlotte Knights starting rotation is more interesting than it was last year. I'm still not crazy about the White Sox starting rotation, but that's the 2024 roster right now. We're not crazy about any of it. So that's the news the White Sox have made. We're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. But coming up next, Yoshinobu Yamamoto contract details are released. What would you ask for, listeners, in a hypothetical major league contract as a perk? And and a new Dylan Cease rumor next on the Sox Machine podcast. Welcome back to the Sox Machine podcast. Joel Sherman of the New York Post wrote in his column... Posted at 6.10 p.m. Central Time on Thursday night, January 4th. Headlined, Yankees may have to opt for like rather than love to fill out rotation. The column is about the Yankees' options after missing out on Yoshinobu Yamamoto. And Sherman had this nugget of information when it comes to starting pitching options for the Yankees. And that includes the possibility of trading for Dylan Cease. Sherman wrote, quote, the White Sox are more likely to move Dylan Cease, but they see the soaring pitching contracts in free agency and the concurrent desperation among teams. So the three premium prospects ask was so high that, for example, the Atlanta Braves decided to take the risk of acquiring Chris Sale instead, end quote. This seems to scan with Atlanta making it clear in Nashville when we were there, Jim, during the winter meetings that they were out on cease. Now the Cincinnati Reds general manager, Nick Kroll, saying the Reds are done with major moves before opening day after they signed Frankie Mata. So Braves hot on the cease trail, then not. Reds hot on the cease trail, then not. If Sherman's information is right, and it's hard to dispute at this moment, Jim, seeing how Cease hasn't been moved and no real team is hot on his trail at the moment, what do you put the odds of Cease getting dealt before opening day at now? 
I've been wrong about Cease's uh, future or when he's going to be moved the entire winter. So I figure like, I think the odds are pretty good. And then he'll probably be moved uh, before this podcast comes out. So that's kind of been my record with Cease <laughs> so far. I've, I've, but, you know, based on uh, the Reds leaking the, or not even, I guess they must have leaked the offer the White Sox demanded uh, from the Reds to two reporters, the Cincinnati Inquirer, talking about like I think three top pitching the the, the three premium prospect uh, package, uh, which does mesh with what Sherman's saying. Um, if he holds it, that then I think it might be pretty unlikely because you know thinking back to the Luis Castillo deal uh, with the Mariners and Reds, and that's kind of like if the White Sox don't deal cease by opening day then that's more or less the target they're going for is like a deal for like the, what the Mariners received or sorry, what the Reds received when they traded Luis Castillo to the Mariners a couple of years ago at the deadline. And they received two premium prospects. They received Edwin Arroyo and they received uh, Noel Lee Marte. So like if Nick crawl, who was the GM uh, on the receiving side or, or, or sending uh, you know, Castillo out and receiving prospects in return, if he's been in that discussion before for a comparable pitcher and says like, well, you know, like we got two premium prospects and a couple lesser, you know, like one major league ready pitcher uh, and Andrew Moore and another prospect as well, like an older pitcher. Um, if we got two premium prospects and like an extra major league player and then like a, a throw in prospect for Luis Castillo, uh, why is the price so much higher now for a pitcher who might not be Luis Castillo good? And so like, I can see him being like, no, I, I know what this is like. And, you know, inflation hasn't reached the trade market this degree to where I'm going to move, you know, and, and feel like especially motivated to move three, four good prospects, uh, which is what the White Sox were asking for. So that's why I think like there might be a, a degree of stubbornness here. Uh, and, you know, if Getz is really asking for like three top 100 prospects, I can see other more seasoned GMs who have made similar deals saying like, no, I'm not ready for that yet. Let's check in back at the deadline. Yeah, they're not getting three top 100 prospects for Dylan sees it. If, Sh if Sherman is right. And again, there's really, it's hard to dispute Sherman's information. No matter what you think listeners, and I'm sure we'll get this feedback. We're like, well, that's what you have to ask. Somebody will meet it. They really want Dylan Cease. And if you don't, they don't want to meet the price and you start the season with Dylan Cease. Yeah, you could, you could go with that. But there are some risks that you have to add into the calculation. Cease could get hurt or Cease could be repeating his 2023 performance despite having Brian Bannister in tow. And uh, you're not going to even get the Luis Castillo return at the deadline. Like, theoretically, this should be his highest value is right now. And I think you wrote about this at socksmachine.com. Swords is a, an official stat on baseball savant and, and Dylan Cease led that last year. I don't know if teams covet that type of pitching metric yet. It is a fun one. Thanks to the pitchy ninja. Uh, and I love his stuff and follow him all the time and, and enjoy the podcast. And he has a recent show interviewing Dylan Cease about swords uh, that I highly recommend to to watch or listen. But even though I think Cease is going to bounce back in 2024, Jim, I agree with opposing GMs. You are not getting three top 100 prospects for Dylan Cease. You're just not. Yeah, unless it's like, yeah. And I guess it raises the question back to Chris Getz. Like, can you close deals? Like he, he closed the deal with Aaron Bummer that we like that return. But for those that aren't crazy about that return, I think they have valid criticism, Jim. The Braves were going to be cutting mm -hmm. these guys. Like you just acquired guys that the Braves were going to be DFAing. So maybe in a way you did Atlanta a favor of making that Aaron Bummer trade. Like I think that's valid criticism. Like maybe the price is too high and maybe the White Sox with that high price are not that serious about trading Dylan C's. Yeah, it's, I think it's a... Tough spot for Getz because, like, it is the litmus test in terms of, like, his immediate competence. And, like, it's going to be one he's going to feel immense pressure to get right um, because 
one of the flaws of the rebuild is like looking at it now, the Chris Sale trade, the Jose Quintana trade, the Adam Eaton, the Adam Eaton trade worked out basically as well as possible. Like you'd like to see, like, like I wrote about, like the only shame is that like uh, Lopez and Giolito didn't have good seasons at the same time or great seasons at the same time. Like the best work was yeah. opposite a slump from the other. So like, you know, that's maybe one case of it not being the best picture, but otherwise like, you know, getting Giolito and Lopez and Dunning who turned into Lynn, like that's a very good return and a pretty good outcome. All things considered when two guys get Cy Young votes in the same season uh, and, and another guy turns into a valuable reliever, but like, you know, Mankata uh, and Kopech didn't really click. Uh, Cease, probably the best possible outcome for you know, Cease's career at the White Sox might be like a 80th or 90th percentile outcome for the White Sox based on where he was when the White Sox traded for him. And yet that didn't really turn into like a massive win because Jimenez has been disappointing. So like, I think Getz having been around for that sees like, well, we saw what happened when it didn't connect. So I really have to get this right. And I don't know if that's less than a takeaway from it because like, uh, the White Sox where it failed was like not being able to develop their own pipeline of talent. And once all those prospects graduated, they couldn't graduate anybody else of note to supplement or replace players. They had to hang on for every player of dear life uh, who could show the possibility of contributing in the majors because they just couldn't uh, produce anybody else. But that's kind of, I'm wondering if that's gets his mindset is just feeling like he has to really have a deal where everybody says, oh my God, what a great job you did versus getting a deal that's good enough. And people are like, eh, I was hoping for more. This 2024 White Sox team isn't going to be good. It's 2017 all over again. And we all got burned by that. So there's a lot less faith than just prospects alone. So I, I can think it's kind of a lose-lose situation for Getz. Like he was dealt a losing hand. And now it's just a matter of like how he gets out of it. And, uh, you know, on one hand, I don't envy him on the other one. Like on the other hand, like this is the only GM job he could possibly get in major league baseball. So yeah, this is, this is his reward for getting a job. He's, uh, not qualified for is having to, yeah, having one trade, uh, assets that you really need to capitalize on to have people feel good about you being there. So my feeling about Dylan Cease getting traded, it started at the beginning of this offseason in late October at 1%, where I said Dylan Cease is still going to be the opening day starter for the White Sox in 2024. Then the rumors got more serious, up to 50%. I was 99.99% sure that Cease was going to get traded in Nashville when we were there, Jim, during the winter meetings. I'm back down to 50%. Like, I think it's a coin flip that cease gets dealt. If I come back from vacation later January and cease still hasn't been traded a couple weeks, three weeks before spring training starts, then I don't think it's going to happen. And that cease is going to start with the white Sox in 2024 on opening day. And you just move forward and see what adjustments Bannister and Ethan Katz can make with Dylan cease to improve in 2024 and we'll revisit this conversation mid June when teams get serious about adding before the deadline. Yeah. I think the one, you know, if you're trying to kind of look at other things that aren't the cease, you know, the status of cease to look for cues. And if you're trying to spin it positively, or at least like an optimistic fashion, you could say, well, right field, maybe they're not making any major league moves requiring, you know, good players like Kiermaier or uh, a Harrison Bader type because they figure one of the players that get back from Cease, you know, one of the guys they might be talking about as an additional tertiary player in a trade package might be the guy who plays right field for the White Sox. Might be that guy who, you know, is a... Uh, push out of an outfield, but could get a long extended run with the White Sox. So like that's one possibility is they're just leaving it open for the package they've been talking about. Um, the other one is I wonder, you know, if, with Getz, if it's going to be three prospects, three prospects, three prospects, and then like somebody makes him the offer for the two he really wants, like done, you know, just he holds out like it, three prospects is his price until it suddenly isn't because he got the two prospects plus extra players 
that he wanted. And uh, the timing was such that like, this was as good as you could do probably at the deadline. So why not just do it now and start your planning right away? If that is the plan for right field, like I understand that. But again, if I come back from New Zealand and Australia and Dylan sees hasn't been dealt Jim spring training is rapidly approaching. And I am sure, I mean, yeah. it, it's not, it's a very shallow pool anyways to work with in free agency to find a right fielder. That fear, the beginning part of the podcast where White Sox fans think that Brett Phillips could be the starting right fielder in opening day is just going to continue growing if Getz cannot pivot. And if he yeah. can't pivot, then he's just repeating the same mistakes as the predecessors to Rick Kahn and Kenny Williams. Yeah, I think like by late January, that's when teams really start planning everything. Right. Like planning their budgets, planning their budgets for next year, planning what they need uh, for draft boards. Uh, with prospects they have, prospects they don't. Like you would think that you know there'd just be either it gets done or it doesn't by that point. So I agree with you there that like it seems like too big of a deal when it comes to both players going and players leaving. Like we've seen free agents sign that late or even later. Uh, yeah, Bryce Harper, teams, Manny Machado. Yeah. Uh, like Prince Fielder, I think was one of those guys. Uh, you know, back when when Victor Martinez got injured, and then the Tigers swooped in uh, with the price. So like we've seen free agents last that long, but teams interested in signing them probably have that money earmarked or the roster spot earmarked being like, yeah, just waiting, 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 waiting. Uh, you know, and you know, we have the resources where uh, if he signs for somebody else for a price we think is ridiculous, we don't mind that much. Uh, we don't mind a team saving us from our desperation. Uh, but when it comes to players both coming and going, I think, and like trading guys who you might need for depth, like, you know, if uh-huh. the Reds are talking about like, you know, three prospects, you know, one guy might be like the premier backup infield and another arm might be one of the arms they'd count on in the second half. Like at some point you think you have to like, if you're trading two or three premium prospects or prospects plus like real major league depth, um, you would think that trading those guys would require replacements somewhere along the way, whether it's NRIs, whether it's like putting other prospects on different timetables, uh, might adjust the kind of signing you make, uh, over the course of the winter. You'd think like the amount of bodies that would move in a Dylan cease trade would require a lot more forethought and planning in terms of just down the road, uh, you know, whether it's roster emergencies in April or August, so that's why I think like, yeah, it'd probably be sooner rather than later when it comes to January. Watch a Dylan C's trade happens as I'm in flight <laughs> to New Zealand. That'll be my luck. That would be my luck. All right. So let's go to our last topic of the show. So Yoshinobu Yamamoto, big contract, right? Well, we found out some of the contract perks thanks to John Heyman on Twitter. And Heyman tweeted out that Yamamoto's getting a personal trainer his own physical therapist, four business class round trip airline tickets per year, and one premium economy round trip airline ticket to Los Angeles for his family. So five family members, four get to enjoy business class flying from Tokyo to Los Angeles. One, I'm assuming some type of in-law or cousin he doesn't like that much, uh, but still needs to invite them over because it makes mom happy. Uh, gets the premium economy round trip ticket uh, from Tokyo to Los Angeles. And wherever the Dodgers are playing, the Dodgers must make best efforts to make Japanese food available. So Dodgers play in Chicago. That's doable. Uh, I'm not sure about other baseball markets around the country. I'm not sure what the Japanese food situation is like in St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, for example, but those are the contract perks for Yamamoto. And there's been a variety of contract perks in baseball. When Manny Ramirez played and signed in Japan, part of his contract included unlimited sushi. Ichiro, when he was playing for the Seattle Mariners, when he signed his second contract, had a $40,000 a year stipend to rent a house in Seattle, despite making millions of dollars. Raleigh Fingers, back in the day, 
had a hundred dollar mustache wax allowance to keep his signature look, Jim. Rogan Odor, when he signed a contract to the Texas Rangers, he required that they gave him two horses. And then John Lester in his contract with the Chicago Cubs, Lester got 25 hours of private air travel per season. So those are just some other unique examples of the additional perks players could get in their contract. So it had me thinking, Jim, if we were good enough to sign a big free agent contract in major league baseball, what kind of unique, weird or contract, uh, crazy contract clauses would you require Jim? It is, you know, like reading through these various, like, uh, you know, demands or packages kind of reminds me a little bit of like the uh the riders they would talk about like van halen having on their tours like you know you must you know not have any brown m&ms in the bowl like you're going that specifically and you know whether it's because they were prima donnas or whether it's because they were just paying attention to how closely uh various venues were reading the rider list and like if they screwed up the m&ms what else did they screw up like it you know whether it's a way to gauge yeah. their uh competence but like it's really, you know, I've never been in a position where like, you know, being in journalism, like asking for those perks, like, ha, <laughs> huh? like, yeah, lucky if you get a raise. <laughs> That's kind of, uh, so yeah, it, it's hard to fathom, but the, you know, first class airline tickets, like makes a lot of sense to me. Like just especially yeah. traveling overseas, especially if you have family going or private travel, like that all makes sense. I think I prefer first class to private just because of like, you know, environmental thing. Like it's, it makes more sense. Like, you know, first class is plenty good. Uh, if it's going to a destination that's, you know, well served, which I think, you know, most overseas destinations are, I like the ones where they talk about like, you know, having a suite available, like, you know, not even like, you know, box seats or anything like that, but just, you know, having a suite for your family, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's 10 games a year, like that sounds kind of cool. Like, yeah, if, especially if you could like have it uh, uh, to your liking in terms of like outfitted uh, that I think that would be great. Like having like a uh, one that like rivals Jerry Reinsdor Reinsdorf's owner suite or like even better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, just I as think a Bryce power. Harper has that with the Phillies. Like, yeah, I think the Phillies have to give Bryce Harper an opportunity to buy a luxury suite at the Philly stadium, which I think Harper does. Yeah, I think, you know, the thing that I would get out of it is, like, I would want, like, the Yohan Mankata deal. Like, yeah, I want, like, 50 hours of recording time at, like, a premium music studio in the city. Not to record anything, but just to mess around with, like, all of the instruments and, like, play nice. through top of line, uh, yeah, guitars, amps, pianos, etc. like drums, you know, mic'd up drums. Uh, even if it's terrible, like, you know, nobody has to be there with me <laughs> except for somebody show me how it all works. But just having access, like that kind of stuff would be, I, I think, uh, a perk of being a celebrity in a city, like going to uh, the Chicago music exchange, for instance, instance, and like getting access to all those guitars, I think would be, uh, a lot of fun. So I think that would be a perk I would try to, uh, to leverage. Uh, there's also like the charity aspect, which, uh, you know, I think Chris sale in the deal, he just signed with the Braves, like 1% of his contract goes to the Braves foundation. Like, yes. I think like, that'd be cool. Like have the Negro leagues museum, like, Hey, you know, get a little, uh, you know, uh, cut of a contract being signed, uh, you know, food pantries, always good. Also like Curling clubs can always use money. So maybe just they're there. Those are nonprofits. So, Hey, a little bit of that too. So I think you can, you can spread the wealth around pretty easily, but beyond like uh perks only for me, but I think, yeah, probably my perk would be like, yeah, give me a, give me some recording time. Uh, especially the white Sox, like in the, yeah, I've signed the white Sox and they have the stadium thing, like turn one of your broadcasts, like studio D into a soundproof room with, uh, yeah, the best, equipment you can rent so I can mess around for like a few hours at a time. Nice. Okay. I like that. That that's a good one. That's a unique one. I, I disagree with you. The private air travel that is on my bucket list. Just one time in my life, I would like to fly on a private jet more than an hour <laughs> so I can enjoy it. Like maybe I'll visit you one day, Jim on a private flight uh, in Nashville. 
Uh, I, I, I want to do that at least once. So I can understand like John Lester wanting 25 hours of private air travel. I'm sure. If he still had a house in Boston uh, to go back between Boston and Chicago, there you go. Don't need to join the peasants. You could just take your private air travel hours for the Chicago Cubs. Uh, some ideas that I had spring training home, like that would be big. Hmm. Like you have to provide a house for me for spring training. Uh, because we have heard, I haven't been to spring training. Many of you that have listened have been to spring training. That is the one thing that people keep telling me that and renting a car, uh, finding an Airbnb, getting a, a hotel room for spring training can be difficult. And if it's difficult for fans, I can't imagine how difficult it is for players trying to secure homes for spring training. Uh, I like a lot of players have this. They get a hotel suite. When they're on the road, they don't have to share rooms with teammates. I like that one a lot. They get vehicles sometimes leased to them. Like I would want a, a Jeep Grand Cherokee lease for the season that the team pays because I got to I gotta travel to your stadium. I got to drive myself to the stadium. Now, my wife, Kim, brought up a good idea. You provide a driver for me to make sure that I securely get to the ballpark. Like I like that idea. If I were a position player, I would want in the contract that I would receive an additional $10,000 for every inning that I pitched as a position player, just as a little perk to get embarrassed, to have, to be in the highlights, everybody laughing at me, throwing 60 mile per hour, lazy loft balls to home plate, getting smashed and just trying to get out of the inning. I need... Additional bonus money, ten thousand dollars. Hazard pay, exactly. And back to the private flight. And I think some teams do this, but not all teams. If your, if I was an agent, any of my clients make the All Star Game private flight to the All Star Game, not flying them commercial, because that's what the Washington Nationals did for Juan Soto. They forced him to fly commercial. All these guys, all the social media, they get to fly on private planes. Is it an award from the team? Congratulations. You're going to the all-star game. Not Juan Soto. Not Soto who helped the Nationals win the World Series. Nope. You got to fly commercial across country. That's environmentally sound. To Seattle. Unbelievable. But those are some of the perks that I would want. But I really like yours, like the 50 hours of recording time. That would be great. That would be a lot of fun, even from a podcast standpoint, too. That would be fun. Yeah, I th- I just think, like, wouldn't want to actually own all those, uh, you know, like, here's a third uh, Gibson Les Paul ever made. Like, <laughs> like I don't want to necessarily own that, but to play it once uh, with, through, like, yeah. the best amps and pedals and everything like that, sure. Uh, let's go nuts. And actually have, like, somebody there teach me how to use it, teach me how to get the most of it, teach me what it's supposed to sound like. And then, uh, you know, not record anything because I'm terrible, but I would have fun. <laughs> yeah. Send me up with the rhythm about. section. Just like, let's have a, you know, just, uh, and, you know, just play the most basic stuff with the, with the, you know, use the best possible equipment for the, uh, least demanding possible music. I like it. I would love to hear, and read what you guys would ask for. If you signed a hypothetical major league baseball contract, what weird, crazy perks would you want to be in that contract? Let us know on socksmachine.com on the podcast post in the comment section below and what your crazy ask would be. So Jim's is the, the 50 hours of recording time. I like that. If I had to pick one, uh, I would go with the spring training home. Like that would be my requirement. Uh, to make it easier for everyone involved in my life to to have a place to live while getting ready for the upcoming season. But that will do it for this episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you just discovered the Sox Machine Podcast, you can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts, such as Spotify and Apple Music. We also upload our podcast episodes into our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Machine. You can follow us on social media, on all the platforms at Sox Machine, or you can follow me at Sox Machine underscore 
Josh. If you enjoy our work and you want more, you can get more by becoming a Patreon supporter at patreon.com slash machine, where our Patreon supporters get exclusive content. They get ad-free versions of both the website and the podcast. And when we have exclusive Sox Machine events, like our current event that will be hosted in February, our Patreon supporters are invited. I think we still have some tickets available, some spots open, Jim, for the curling. Yep. So I just sent out an update. Um, mentioned in the update that uh, Jacob Pomerenke, the one of the nation's leading uh, experts on the Black Sox 1919 World Series scandal and the aftermath, he will be joining us. He's an avid curler, just moved to Chicago, so he's thrilled. So, yeah, uh, come join us. Uh, pepper Jacob with all of your questions about uh, the Black Sox scandal and everything you ever want to know and he will give you more information than you ever thought possible just from the top of his head awesome so again you can sign up at patreon.com slash socks machine where monthly plans start at two dollars or you can save with an annual subscription the socks machine podcast is a production of socksmachine.com you're over all of the chicago white Sox baseball and part of the blue wire podcast network Alongside Jim Margulis, I'm Josh Delson. Thanks for listening and watching.